Um, the Lord just let me know I was getting ready to do a video. Uh, and we've been kind of going over it while I set everything up. First and foremost, I am God's righteous servant of Isaiah 53, who is Moshiach of Isaiah 11. What I'm about to read to you is my proof. I have about 40 videos, 45 videos uh, that come from these two books. And God has me flip them, as I call it, all the time with changes in the details, you know, the information, what's this about, the title, uh, because some people, the title that exists doesn't make them look at the video. Uh, so we'll, we'll do something different. Uh, the videos uh, have now been posted. Now, what I do is I re-download them and re-upload them. So it's pretty much the same video every time, but you get different information, title, and what they call the details. And that is now up to it, more than a thousand. A thousand posting of 40 videos. But it keeps them circulating. See, I'm not a rabbi. I'm not a pastor, priest. I have nothing to do with Christianity. Uh, and yet I'm a Gentile. You say, well, how can you be a righteous servant Moshiach and, and a Gentile? Well, all you got to do is read Isaiah 63. Who is this coming from a down? And God says, it is I. And of the peoples, that would be his peoples, the Jewish people, none are with him. Now, Adam is associated with Esau, the brother of Jacob, who became Israel. And Esau married only Gentile women. And all of his descendants are known as Gentiles. And the actual city of Adam was east of the River Jordan, uh, in Jordan, the country Jordan, uh, is where it would be today if it existed. He's coming from Gentile lands, and no Jewish people are with him. Well, when God comes in the day of the Lord, which you find in Malachi 3, he says, I'm coming to return to my temple. Um, <laughs> so, when he comes from Adam, he's coming from uh, lands of Gentiles. Uh, sometimes uh, it was referred to as Rome, uh, Adam was. Uh, in the Talmud, and then it was Christian Rome, uh, Rome uh, obviously fell away, and your left was also a reference to Christianity. But it's two Gentiles in general. And um, I will convert Orthodox, it will be as though I've always been a Jew when we get to Jerusalem. But that is one of the problems I'm having with getting these books published, that, and it really takes Judaism to task. Uh, and God wants to take him to task. He took him to task. That's what his book's about. That and Christianity. And Isaiah 53 in the day of the Lord, which is here. And I was, I'm going to, it's very easy to see. I, I don't know why uh, these, these intelligent rabbis, Jewish people, uh, have such a problem with figuring out when is God coming. I mean, there's nothing to it. But anyway, it's today, and I'll show you why. But, uh, you know, he says when he comes, when Moshe acts here, he's going to have a reckoning and dismiss all of the rabbis and appoint one shepherd to be a ruler among them, a leader. It's not a king. It's not a kingdom. It's not a dynasty. All these things Ramban just made up. None of that's in the scripture. You see, these things irritate the fire out of God. When he's irritated, I don't have a good day. You know, we've been together 13 years now. He doesn't leave me. Uh, he and the angel of his presence, which you never hear Judaism talk about. It's the Holy Spirit. It's in Isaiah 63. <laughs> it's it's kind of hidden in there. It's the only time you hear the phrase, but wherever God's presence is, there's an angel with him. Divine beings, plural. Who did Jacob wrestle with? And then God told him, I'm changing your name to Israel. Who did he wrestle with? He tells us, I wrestled with a man and divine beings. Judaism says, Jacob wrestled with an angel. No. 
if, if the Spirit of God alights and enters upon a man, as they did with Ezekiel, God's there too. God in the lights upon and enters you too, his presence. And he takes over, by the way. Yeah, he takes he takes full control of everything. Your mind, your thoughts, your words, your physical movements in the cords of his power. Um, it's a pretty amazing thing. But uh, that that's you know, they just went to a man near Jacob and said, uh, wake up. I'm the God of Israel. I'm the God of this land. I have something for you to do. And you know what you say when God does that? You say, okay, I'm ready. Here I am. Let's go. Because you know who it is. I mean, there's no doubt. In it. You're not hearing voices. You, you know who it is. It, because he can put knowledge into you and in your mind without speaking. And he can control your emotions so you don't fall to the ground. You say, okay. And they would have told him, go wrestle with that man. And, and, and they would have assured him, you're going to be safe. My, my power's on you. And I'm going to be coordinating the whole wrestling match. And uh, that's a man of divine things. And that's what I am because the Spirit of God alighted upon me pursuant to Isaiah 11, uh, verse 1. And God is in his Spirit. See? I'm in my spirit, my spirit is in me. Same with you. Same with God. He created an angel, and for that angel's body, he uses not a human form with wings, but his very spirit. So anyway, those are the divine beings, and Judaism dropped the ball on that. So, uh, I think the last video we really did on this was, it was the ten fallacies, misbeliefs, and some uh, faulty reasoning uh, in Judaism, the one true religion of Abraham. You know, so at the same time, I'm, I'm hitting it hard and saying you got things wrong. I'm acknowledging that God is the God of Israel. God is the God of the Jewish people. No question about it. That's the problem with getting the books published. Here's the problem with that. I bring two covenants. Covenant of friendship that comes with Moshe. God grants it when his servant David is here. And uh, sin forgiveness, Jeremiah, I just mentioned this. And God had me type it such that they don't go into effect until published. And of course, I'm sure I've irritated the fire of every rabbi, telling them the things that they don't know, and they've been dismissed and aren't going into the school of remembrance and into heaven, unless they start teaching these books. And let's say, and, and, and some rabbis will say, wait a minute, I, I don't even have a synagogue or a flock. Uh, you know, I don't teach any of this. I don't teach a false messianic era. There's something you can do. And until Judaism gets straightened out, all rabbis dismissed, 100%. No exceptions. Doesn't matter how much he likes you. You dismiss him. Believe me. <laughs> He's harsh. Very harsh. So, uh, what I'm going to do, since I, we have like a thousand postings of 40 videos, many with different titles, and this and that, uh, I'm going to go through the addendum attached. It's a summary of every chapter, one after another, uh, in about one paragraph, sometimes two, sometimes three. And it's 25 pages long. So this is probably going to be a two-part video. It's going to be pretty long, but it's also a good way to get familiar with my videos, kind of put them in some kind of structure or an idea. Now, you can find this book at keithmccartymccarty.wordpress.com, both books. Uh, the second book is called The Life of God's Last of Seven. I just mentioned that. Uh, and, and, and there you can find the index. And it's also, I put it in the details of, of uh, a couple of the videos. So I'm going to go through that addendum, one after another, um, to put some structure into this. Be, I mean, it's gotten hard for me to follow. You know, uh, God has me use a motorcycle, uh, the Indian motorcycle, because he knows how much I love him. 
And he said, it's the best thing. You know, I can't put you in a synagogue or a picture of uh, a religious picture of the wall or anything behind you because you're my servant. And uh, you haven't converted. Um, sometimes he tells me, I might not have you convert. I don't really have to. You know why? This is what he told me the other night. He says, look, Abram, who became Abraham, was not a Hebrew. I just called him one. I just decided, Abraham, you're a Hebrew. Abram, the Hebrew. He wasn't born Hebrew. This is the first time we ever see the word. Same thing with Mordecai does you. <laughs> Mordecai has nothing to do with Judah. Okay? He's a Benjamite. And, of course, the bad guy in that story is going after all the Jewish people. And it says, Mordecai, uh, the Jew, and his people. So, you know, God says, uh, you know, and then I named Israel, uh, Jacob Israel. And they became Israelites. He says, I can just say it if I want to. <laughs> he said, but it's probably easier just to have you convert. He said, I'll just call you Keith the Jew. And that's it. <laughs> he says, I'm God. Do anything I want to. <laughs> He's something else. He's got a great humor. I mean, he, he was making me laugh, but uh, here we go. This is an introduction in uh, the first book, Isaiah 53, the day of the Lord. And, and again, God's telling me to type this. These aren't my words. I'm not taking credit for knowing all these things. Because I wouldn't. I was an atheist for 50 years. Never read the Bible. Well, I had nothing to do with, with religious people. And if you read my book on my life, you see why. I'm just one of those people who just went through too many bad times. Uh, too many, uh, too many bad times. And I just, just, I don't know. It was in the 70s, and nobody, even when I was a teenager. <coughs> I'm 64 today. Isaiah 53 describes God's righteous servant. A man who has never been identified by fitting all 12 verses. There's actually three more. It starts in Isaiah 52, 13 to 15. There are three more men prophesied to come in the future time who have never been identified. So you get the righteous servant of Isaiah 53 and three more men who are God's servant David the shepherd not a king. Elijah, the messenger and recounselor of families, and who clears the way for the Lord to return to the temple, and the prophet like Moses. Now, King David, Elijah, and Moses were all righteous men, and they were all servants of God. So we're looking for a God today that can be identified, and we use Isaiah 53 to do it. Now, there's supposed to be four total righteous servants. But we got one description. God sending these three men in the future time must include a description of them. And the sages knew that. They, they put that in the town. They said Moshiach is the righteous servant. And they called him the leper scholar. Because he's crushed with disease. He's familiar with disease, and yet he makes the many righteous by his knowledge. How do Christians just ignore that? I don't know, but I'm going to lay it on them. I can tell you that. I bring his wrath. He passed to him in 51. Isaiah 51. And then my description starts in 52, where he says, I'm passing my, uh, the bowl of my wrath, my cup of reeling uh, from you, my people, to those who told you to get down on the ground and walked all over you. That would be Christianity. They sold you your book. Said you didn't know how to read it. It's prophetic of Jesus. Yeah, I don't know how you can get there. But anyway, the long description of God's righteous servant is a description of a man who represents all four. You know, they, they're all known for different things. David, basically, uh, well, as much as anything, getting everything together for the first temple, Solomon's temple, and uh, Elijah, the only man taken to heaven, and God returns him? What's that about? Never heard Judaism talk about it. Well, I have all the answers to that. 
basically means there's nothing about heaven I can't tell you. And there's a lot to it. There's a lot to it. The description that is inherently and the implicitly a description of one man with the attributes and capabilities of the descendant of King David, Elijah, and the prophet like Moses. And that's me. Remember, the Spirit of God lies upon me, and God is in him. And now he is controlling. He's the one that taught me all this. Again, atheist for 50 years. Um, and, it, it, you know, no single man could ever do what the rabbis say of the Messianic era. No shit can't compel all of Israel to study Torah, follow Torah. You can't, no man can do that. It's not a doable thing. But anyway, I get on them about that. But even what I had to do, just presenting myself to the Jewish people, and, and there's nothing I, you know, it, just imagine, what could God do if he commanded and controlled a man, his very thoughts, his very words? Knew his personality from birth. Had been with him from birth, but didn't talk to him until I was 50 to make sure I lived a life of suffering. And kept me from religion. He, he didn't want me to have any preconceived ideas or notions about uh, Judaism or Christianity. Uh, and I did. So there's the introduction. Just so you know that the righteous servant, Moshiach, Elijah, Prophet like Moses, you're talking about one man can do everything all four can do, and that makes me a man and the nine things. And there's so much to that. Particularly this controlling of my thoughts and minds, because I still feel like I'm me, but he has taught me over the years, in little bitty ways, uh, how he has changed the way I think, the way I present myself. Uh, all of a sudden I'll use words I don't use. And that's how it first started. And I said, did you just do that? He said, yes. <laughs> you know, it's just been such an adventure. And I have such great stories to tell people about God, the God of Israel, the Jewish people. Chapter 1, the leper scholar. Okay, I just went through that, so I'm going to... You know what? He's always to my left in these videos. Holy Spirit to my right. He wants me <clears throat> to pretty much read this. And not, I was about to say, I just kind of covered this. The sages did not believe Isaiah 53 described the Jewish people. They believed a single man was described. And he was the anointed one. Anointed one, Messiah. The Babylon family called him the leper scholar. This is in quotes, the Messiah. What is his name? The rabbis say, the leper scholar. As it is said, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did a stand him a leper, smitten of God and afflicted. When you read the book on me, you, 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 you get to find out how all that applies to me. Afflicted by God. You know, they thought if you were born to a senior, um, God didn't like you. David would have nothing to do with the lame, the blind, the cripple. He'd have nothing to do with them for that very reason. It was a common belief that if you were messed up at birth, it's because God didn't like you. Okay? I was born without a right breast and my shoulder shorter and I got a real skinny withered arm. You know, it works just fine. And God says, I touched you in the womb to do that. For Isaiah 53. That was just the beginning of him uh, preparing me to be this, this the person that I am today. That was from the Sanhedrin. Okay, this is a, that, that that I just read is a commentary on Isaiah 53, verse 4, which says, Yet it was our sickness that he was bearing, our suffering that he endured. We accounted him plagued, smitten, and afflicted by God. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and try to explain that real quick. 
why am I bearing their sickness? Why am I wounded for their sins? Okay, and that's what Christianity takes off with. It's Jesus and you know, our sins are forgiven because he was wounded and crucified. Um, mm -mm. I just told you about the fire of fire, wounded, punishment. Okay, those are all the words that come from the first six verses. And those are the witnesses saying, who can believe our report? And, and then you have, like, 53, 4. By the way, those are in quotes. That's six verses in quotes. Nobody seems to understand that. There's a reason for it. Those are the many made righteous. Okay. And they're saying he was wounded for our sins. It's kind of a smell to the Christians for God today. But what it's saying is, I go through this fire of refinement, all these words, so that I am properly prepared and capable to go to these people who are so sick with guilt, which you'll see again in verse 10, because they're not righteous, they're not observant Jews, and their lives are just a mess. Okay, we're going to have this great story. God's here, just like he said, and he's got this prophet. He's the righteous servant. I'm going to be able to draw a lot of those people to observant Judaism, and they'll be healed. So, I am wounded, I am punched, I am crushed and bruised, chastised. But it's just to make me prepare to go to them and say, be observant. Stop saying it. God is real. You atheists, God is real. I was an atheist. He's real. Okay, I don't have faith that he's real. I have absolute knowledge of it. Because I feel his power, his power surrounds me and he's... And there's a heaviness that he can place on me in various degrees. So I don't just hear a voice. This is a whole package. Uh, he can spin me like a top if he wants to. He can slam me to the ground if he wants to. Which what, does what? It hurts your feelings. Uh, uh, it makes you angry. And he's constantly drawing these emotions to it so they start dying out. I, I don't have the kind of anger I once had. Uh, and you can't. As a prophet of God, too many people won't believe you. They'll, they'll make you mad. They'll call you a liar. You know, all that kind of spit on you. And uh, I was a known, you know, I, I, I was a fighter. I, because I had such anger in me. I'm like Moses. And Ezekiel tells us he had a furious spirit. We're just the kind of guys that, that God wants to be a prophet. So that's what that's all about. Wouldn't be for sin. Yeah, but that's just getting me ready to come tell you to stop sinning. It's not because I died. There's no vicarious suffering. There's no vicarious suffering. The ancestral tree. This is Isaiah 11, verse 1 and 2. But a shoot shall grow out of the stump of Jesse. A twig shall sprout from his stock. The Spirit of the Lord shall alight upon him. A spirit of wisdom and insight, a spirit of counsel and valor, a spirit of devotion and reverence for the Lord. That's how people believed in spirits in the Middle Ages and the and antiquity. Okay, most people don't really believe anymore that there's special spirits that can be put on you and change your entire nature. Uh, this book was written for antiquity in the Middle Ages first. And that doesn't mean the Spirit of God is not a person. That was just another way of thinking about it. He had to write it for the early people and for the people of today in the day of the Lord. Isaiah prophetically refers to the stump of Jesse. Of course, God had him write it. Uh, Father King David, as an announcement of the ending of the line of the kings of Judah, whose last king, Jeconia, before the Babylonian exile and destruction of Jerusalem, was banished. God banished them. So that's it. Your lives never ruin again. Okay, so that's the ancestral tree. It's cut down. It's the only one we know of. So what's left? A stump. And what grows from that stump? A new tree. And that's the tree I'm a part of. Guess who can't come from the stump of Jesse? Jesus. If you think God didn't know what they were going to do, you got to think again. 
the line of Jesus is the lines of the kings of Judah. Now, what a Christian would tell you, well, they may have been banished, but he sent us Jesus, so he must have looked the banishment. Yeah, well, he still didn't come from the sun. He can't be, he can't be the anointed one. He can't be Messiah. He can't be Moshe. He just can't be. Just like in Isaiah 53. He's the unblemished Lamb of God. On the man of 53, God crushes with disease. He's familiar with disease. He's afflicted by God. Well, that's not your unblemished lamb. He can't be 53. He can't be 11. Gee, we should just... <laughs> I'm supposed to move on. I had something else I wanted to say. So... Chapter 3, the creation of the angel of his presence. Here's where you get the knowledge I have in my capacity as Elijah. You know, you, know, you got to believe what I'm saying, but God created the person of his spirit. Taking an image of God on the throne, which is, is often done in the Hebrew Bible. We, we know he has no image and no form. But just imagine him. Uh, however you want to imagine, God on the throne. And in his hand, he holds a soul. A pure soul that looks like a ball of white energy. If you can see it. You can't see it. We can't. God takes this soul before his face and creates with his mind and then wills it to be. Yeah, he spoke it and it was. Kind of like the Genesis first page. And then wills it to be the characteristics and traits of the person the soul will be, because a, a, a person is soul combined with spirit. You've got to have both. And usually your references to your souls or to your spirit generally means both of them. It means a person. Uh, the soul is like the DNA of your personality. And then God speaks the words, I am. But he does not use his voice. Now he's creating a person. He uses the voice of the angel spirit he's creating, the person he's creating. Okay, and they hear that. They hear themselves say, I am. And now God is going to answer in his voice. God becomes the person he is creating. He uses the childlike voice of an angelic person. And God simulates being this new person until he is perfect, as God would have him be. Then God releases that special soul and spirit from before his face with a breath of life, and the person of the spirit of the Holy God was created. That's the angel of his presence, whose body is the spirit of God. God is always in him. So if his spirit aligns upon you, God's in him. God was him. God can always place the person of his spirit before his face and be him and speak as him and through him. And this is how God, my name, is in the angel that was sent to guard the Israelites on the way to the promised land and in the angel of the Lord in the burning bush that God spoke through to Moses. They are the same angel, the angel of God's presence. God says it, that this Israel, uh, angel that went before the Israelites, God says, do not disobey him. He will not forgive you, for I am in him. And there it is in Judaism, then pick up on it. Chapter 4, the angel of God's presence. This is from Isaiah 63, 9 and 10. This is the one I referenced to you. In all their troubles, he was troubled. And the angel of his presence delivered them. Their, their troubles, that's the Jewish people, the Israelites' troubles. In his love and pity, he himself redeemed them. This is the angel of his presence. Raised them and exalted them all the days of old. But they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. camera goes off after half an hour. 
Uh, I was just discussing it with God. And, uh, we're probably going to shorten it up, but hopefully this will give people the, the impetus to go look at the index, go look at the addendum, uh, and get more familiar with all these videos along, because I know they're hard to keep up with. Anyway, continuing that verse, uh, 63 verses 9 and 10. But they grieved his Holy Spirit. Now, an inanimate object cannot be grieved. How can you not believe that his Holy Spirit is a person? He's grieved because the Israelites disobeyed God. Yeah, these are the things he wants straightened out. And all rabbis are going to say this and this until they get straightened out. And I have to be recognized. If you don't recognize Elijah, utter destruction comes to Israel someday. He says he's going to do it, but it, it, what he means is his creation is going to do it. We have to build the temple. That's what keeps Israel safe forever. He says if you'll never be dispersed, defeated and dispersed again. When he puts his sanctuary back amongst them. Which does not have to be on the Temple Mount, by the way. It's got to be on Mount Zion. It's got to be in Jerusalem. <clears throat> but, you know, one, he tells me it's not big enough for what I want. And uh, he said, it's kind of tainted. Ted Islam up there too long. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it doesn't mean you, you know, you have to move to the Wailing Wall or anything. But, uh, because that's one of the biggest obstacles of, of rebuilding this temple. I mean, a lot of people say, well, why don't we work out a deal with the Muslims and, and they can have the Golden Dome and uh, we'll, we'll have our um, God's temple. You know, that's never going to work. It's never going to work. But, and, and, who purchased the temple not for God in repentance for failing the test? King David. But who am I? Well, I'm a twig of the shoe from the stump of Jesus. I'm a twig. You know, I'm sure there's no comparison to who David was and who I am at this point, but I'm on the ancestral tree. It's a twig. But, if it, you, know, if, you know, I'm sure David didn't use his own pocket money. He used kingdom money. Uh, I know people have been raising money to have it built. All I've got to do is appoint me as agent attorney in fact or... You know, there's all kinds of legal ways to do it. Uh, I once was a lawyer before God had me quit. <laughs> you go into poverty. Uh, yeah, again, you'll have the descendant of David by it, must you? You know, in name only. It wouldn't be mine, uh, but it'd be for the people. Or somehow, there's all kinds of ways to do things like this in the law. But that's good to know because... Like I said, that's a big obstacle. You know, what are we going to, we'll have to go to war uh, again because we had taken it back from them and then we let Jordan uh, run the show. Okay, a spirit entered into Ezekiel. Ezekiel says, this is another example of God being in his spirit. And his spirit is in God. Ezekiel said, this is in quotes, this is verses, uh, chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. And he said to me, that would be God, and he said to me, O mortal, stand up on your feet that I may speak to you. As he spoke to me, a spirit entered me, alighted upon and entered him, and set me upon my feet, and I could hear what was being spoken to me. God's thinking, he's, he's telling you, right? God's thinking, but until the Spirit entered me, I could not hear him. He's speaking from within him. Now, he can make it seem like he's talking to you from over here, and that's usually how we do. But it can also be, uh, you know, to your mind, as though he's within you. There's other forms of communication. I mentioned he can put information into you without speaking a word. Uh, the Holy Spirit talks a lot. He's fun to listen to. You know, he's an angel. He's fun. He's my best friend. Uh, God doesn't talk as much. He'll, he'll talk when he's, 
uh, preparing me to be a prophet in his final refinement. We, we've had a lot of disagreements. And which, by the way, I have lost every single one of them. There's no limit. You can't, you, you, you can argue with God. I know the Jewish people say, well, Abraham argued with him, this and that. Uh, you know, go ahead. But if you ever for a moment think you're going to win, and he's right there with you, <laughs> you're about to be in a world of pain. And he'll tell you, just what he told me, first lesson, your pain, Keith, means nothing to me. I have a place I'm taking you to be the prophet I want you to be. And it requires pain and suffering. So you, <laughs> I'm just like, okay. That's what you do with that. Say, okay. <laughs> I mean, there's nothing you can do. He's God. He, you're just thankful that he's got a sense of humor and that when he's not changing you, uh, he's so much fun to be with. And of course the spirit. But there he is right there. He can't, he's not, he's not hearing God until the spirit enters him and God is in his spirit. And that's what happens to Moshe. And you become a man of divine things. Um, okay, I don't want this to go too long. Oh, you know, God is still one. Remember, he, he created this angel. And there's actually verses that, that make that a point. And I'll, I'll go through that one. The Spirit of God... Here's another example. He's got to be a person. The Spirit of God used a spirit to bring Ezekiel in a vision to the exiled community in Chaldea. And God stood by on a hill. In other words, God is with Ezekiel. And it says he ascended from Jerusalem. And descended on a hill east of Jerusalem. And then it says the Spirit of God took Ezekiel on a vision. It's showing the separation of the two. You know, they're, they're always together, but, but they, they, there is a separation to it. You know, here's the presence of God. It's his mind. It's elements of the unseen we can't see. Okay? Here's the spirit of God. Angelic person with a soul and a spirit and who is the person and his body is spirit. They're like clouds, and they just kind of float together. But they're still separate. And, and today, my spirit is within that cloud. If I'm in a room, their presence fills that room. And it will surround everybody in the audience. You'll be all, you know, completely surrounding your body. There's a difference with me. It doesn't surround my body. It goes through me. I have become a part of those those two clouds. My little bitty spiritual cloud, is, yeah, it goes through me. And I can feel his power go through me, too, by the way. This, the things he can do with my body are, well, I'm still learning 13 years later. It, it can be very spooky sometimes. So the Spirit of God used the Spirit to bring Ezekiel into the vision. And God stood by on the hill. And, of course, the only power in heaven is God. The Holy Spirit has no power. There's no angel with power. He, he, he says, I'm not giving anybody my power. He says, and, and frankly, it's not something, that, I mean, I'd have to create a God. Because it's my will. I will things to be. And I have absolute knowledge on how things should come together to create our universe, for instance. The earth, to bring water to it, to gather water from, the, uh, from, from outer space. There's H2O in outer space. It's where all water came from. He drew it from the ends of the universe. So, uh, and there's another verse where the Spirit of God goes to Ezekiel and says, Speak, Ezekiel. So, it's a person. And Jesus, just, they got to get that right. One, <laughs> I have a person here who'd like to be recognized. He's called the angel of God's presence, the Holy Spirit. And God wants him recognized. And he's a, he's a great person. I can tell you all about his personality and how much fun we have and how much he makes me laugh. God can have me on the verge of tears, begging for death, 
And I swear the little guy can make me laugh. It's too funny. Okay. Yeah, this gets deeper and deeper. Now I'm, I'm only on chapter 6. It's 50. <laughs> I hope this, what I'm going to do is stop. That's what I was talking to God about when I had to re-adjust uh, my camera. I hope that gives people an idea of how important it is that these books be read. And uh, I, haven't, I haven't seen anybody from Israel go to my WordPress site. Now, I can't tell on YouTube if anybody from Israel is listening to these videos. I can't account for about half my countries watching half. Of, yeah, half. It, it's just messed up. It just shows the USA, Canada, Germany, and Russia with zero views. I don't know what that is, but Israel doesn't show up on YouTube. They, they got to be out there. They can't possibly have not heard about this. At least some. And like I said, I can account for, you know, with America, that's about 44%. But everybody else together is only about 2% that I just mentioned. So I'm missing over 50% of the countries that are viewing my videos. I don't know who they are. And I, it's just some kind of glitch. But I'm assuming Israel knows that on my WordPress site, where the books are written, I can tell... Uh, the, all the countries that any views come from. And it's imperative these get published in, you know, basically, I think the idea is that I need a strong uh, uh, acknowledgement from a rabbi of all people. <laughs> right? I reckon in this middle, but if they don't want to see God, he's basically putting them in a headlock. You do what he says, or you don't go to heaven. Period. And that's all of it. So, you know, there's more written on this, and make that a lot clearer, and it's on my videos. But he did. He, he said, I'm not mad at all, rabbis, but I want Judaism changed, and I know how you got to, what I have to do to get these people to listen to my prophet. He says, you never listen to my prophet. But, you know, I have so much information, it's ridiculous. I have Elijah information. I've written two books for God. What did, what did Moses do? He wrote the Torah. It was dictated to him. The Orthodox Jews believe that, and they're right. And he dictated these to me. It was at his command and direction. I, I felt like I was pretty involved in it. But um, they got the two covenants. And we need the Jewish people to be a holy seed. And if you read Zechariah, Chapter 1, where Rashi says, we can't tell this, what, what, what this is about. We can't tell. Well, I can tell. Go find my video on it or read it. It's in the book. Uh, and it, 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 it uh, has to do with this day of the Lord at the same time. I put it all together. And, uh, you know, Rashi couldn't. Nobody else has been able to. Rashi says, we got to wait for the teacher of righteousness. This is the same fellow who is attributed with uh, the idea, Isaiah 53 is the people of Israel. He's saying, we got to wait on the teacher of righteousness. Well, they, he's not saying we got to wait on the Jewish people. So somewhere along the line, he changed his mind. Um, he's known for inconsistencies, I understand. But if you look at my video, you'll learn a lot, and you'll see why the importance of getting these covenants because the covenant of sin forgiveness, uh, Syrian, Babylon, and exiles were forgiven uh, in the writings of Isaiah, the Roman dispersal, Jeremiah 31. But that was in Isaiah, but nobody knew. Because you can see in Ezra and Nehemiah, all 13 tribes were turned, by the way. But you can't read those two books and not know that. But... Um, there was still sin, there was all kinds of problems, you know. Uh, but it, had they known they were sin free, I think things had gone a lot easier. Because if you, again, if, if, if you know God has cleared your slate, doesn't remember anything you ever did wrong, and you can see God is acting in the world through his prophet, 
you are likely to come back to the drug of Judaism and stay sin free. You know, any boo boo you have, any uh, uh, evil inclination that gets by you, you know, you, you got Yom Kippur. And he'll be, he'll be more forgiving of that. But we got, there's going to be so many people who never even hear of it. And it's going to be a lot of word of mouth, but it all starts with publishing the books. And uh, if there's a rabbi out there with, with a pretty powerful name who wants to read it, get with me, learn who I am, uh, you can pretty much see my personality on these tapes, but, uh, and endorse my book to a publisher, a Jewish publisher, and tell them, yes, yes, this affects Judaism, but the Jewish people have to hear it. They have to hear it. And somebody with some clout. And they'll go into the scroll of remembrance. Undismissed. Now, if all the white people, people like Toby a Singer preaching that Isaiah 53 uh, is Israel, Read his commentary. I've got it on video. You, you read how he puts Israel in there, and you'll just shake your head and say, it's, that's an absurdity. It's pure foolishness. <laughs> I had other words for it. Jews for Judaism, they got a whole different argument. And it's just as far out there. You know, it's just ridiculous. And I think they know. I think they know how stupid it is. And that makes them liars. Makes them liars. Teaching them this and they ain't care. They, they got no backups for that. Ram Bam. <laughs> Ram Bam's got all kinds of his own problems. He, he fit in with those two, that, those two groups just fine. Two chapters on King Moshiach and his dynasty <laughs> and his kingdom. God knew it was going to be a democratic country. Anyway, so. Yeah, Jeremiah writes with the Roman dispersal. And what does he say in 31? When the desolate lands bloom again, and the whole city is restored. That's not for the Assyrian Babylon exiles. They couldn't even go into the northern kingdom. Gentiles were living there. Yeah, it's for the dispersal. What they had, they came back. That's all. The, you know, where's God? Where's God? And I was like, y'all come back, I'll come back. So that's where we're at. Lands bloom again, cities restored, Jerusalem rebuilt. And he says, you'll never be dispersed and defeated again, and I'm going to make a new covenant with you. Well, you see a new covenant, you say, well, there's only two. One comes with Moshiach, friendship. Where's the other one? Malachi 3. The angel of the covenant that you desire is already on the way. And that's what I understand too. What does that mean, already on the way? That's the angel of the new covenant, the angel of his presence, the Holy Spirit. The angel of the Lord. So you go from Jeremiah to the Malachi 3, which is where God announces the day of the Lord. That's how you know it's here. And what does he say in the first verse? I'm sending my messenger to clear the way. That's Elijah. Which means clear the way to get the simple built. Because he says, because I'm going to return to my temple. And Judaism, I mean, it has nothing to do with the Messianic here. It's like, the, I don't even know... <laughs> Rabbis read Malachi, Malachi's story. You sure can't tell. You sure can't tell. The Messianic era is nothing but a lie. It's just made up stuff. You can't find it in Scripture. And particularly if you understand, Scripture was written for antiquity in the Middle Ages first, and then for the common era, the era uh, ages of medicine, science, information, and now the Internet. you gotta know how to. You got to know how to read it. And they don't. Um, so that's where they're at. Again, I need people to read it. I need it to get around. But uh, more importantly, if you just look at the index and this summary that I just started into, it'll give you a better handle on all these videos I'm, I'm putting out there. Again, it's only about 45. We just keep redoing them. Different titles, a little clean up here and there. But the video itself remains the same. And I know, you know, you, you see it under one time, you, hang, you go, oh, I want to watch that. And then you see a different time, you see and you turn it on, and then you go, hey, hey, I've seen this. 
What are you doing? What's going on? Well, first of all, I'm doing what I'm told to do from God himself. So he said, that's what we got to do. We're too small. And my audience is the Jewish people. I absolutely know how much I offend the Christians because I lay it on. And boy, I'm not done by any stretch of the imagination. 53 and 11. He can't be them. He's a myth and a liar. No question about it. He changed the prophecy of Zechariah from riding an ass into Jerusalem and being executed by the Gentiles. It's not what it is. And he says, all the prophets say to me. Nobody said that of him. You can find it one place about an ass being ridden into Jerusalem by the Messiah, the anointed one. And what does he do when he gets there? He defeats Rome. If it was back then, he defeats the enemy. He makes the Middle East lay down and becomes ruler over everything. He changed it. He absolutely lied. He said he's a myth. The person who absolutely lied is the person who wrote that gospel. They knew better than that, that it didn't fit the Jesus story that was going on a hundred years before his birth. Because it's, it's based on the Essenes, the writers of the Dead Sea Scrolls, prolific writers and commentators. Their founder is named the Teacher of Righteousness. That's Isaiah 53. They had their own gate to Jerusalem. Do you think... If they heard about some man working miracles like Jesus did, saying he was the teacher of righteousness, you think they wouldn't have written about it? You think they wouldn't have gone out and had a little talk with him? Nothing. You don't see his name for 40 more years when Jerusalem's being destroyed by Rome. I see some rabbis that say, hey, we got to take that Jesus story that the Gentiles love to hear at the gate and give us money. And his friend would have said, he said, hey, you can put that story with the Hebrew Bible, it's ridiculous. And his friend would have said, hey, nobody reads, nobody can read. Nobody has these scrolls, nobody can check it. <laughs> she lie, whatever we need to, but it's a great story. And that's what they did. And then 53 is like a snare. God put all those words in there, wounded for our sins, crushed, bruised, chastised. For, you know, things we did, all this vicarious statements, that he's bearing it, vicarious, 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 and it turns out, no, no, that's just what I got to do to my prophet. That's, these are the things I got to do to my man of Isaiah 53 to get him right. I got to break his will. I got I to gotta drain his emotions from him. You know, it's like, it's like uh, a sergeant training a cadet for the Marines. You know, just beat him down. Sleep deprivation, everything. God knows every trick in the book. That's, that's what it is. So it's kind of like a snare. Because because he needed the Gentiles to have religion. He needed them to. And he knew what they were going to do. Uh, with Leviticus. Uh, just like Sophie's saying right here. Toby went Christian. Um, he did. But you know, we don't have any Jews if it wasn't in America. You know, most people would speculate that Germany would have won the war and uh, still be finding them here and there, but they, they wouldn't be the great people they are today. And they wouldn't have their own state. So he had to do it. And uh, But he also knew he was going to come crush Christianity on the day of the Lord, and he's going to use me, a righteous servant, Elijah, Moshiach, and a prophet like Moses to do it. And that's a pretty powerful prophet if you think about it. But I'm really no different from them. They were all men in divine beings. And you can find it, it's in the Torah. David was. De Moses definitely was. And uh, it's in my videos. You can find it. Elijah, definitely. So that they're all righteous servants. They were all divine, men in divine beings. Uh, and that's what I am. And God just tells me what to do, and I do it. I don't do anything on my own. I have no self-will. I'm the only human being on this planet. Man is defined as, as, as uh, having self-will, and animals don't. I don't have self-will. 
God provides myself for my will. Good in the day. So, um, okay, that, that's going to wrap this up. I, I must be at 45 minutes or better. And um, they get too long, but I, I, I can't go through the whole thing. And, and he said, I knew you wouldn't be able to. It's too long. But we're going to give them enough. We'll, we'll get a lot of people interested in reading at least some of the book. And it will put the videos in a better context. Understanding there's only so many of them. Uh, and what it's all about. It's about the day of the Lord. It's about how do you recognize the man of Isaiah 53. Well, I fit the verses. And I got a book to back that up. But it's this knowledge. It's these books that tell you. It's just like the Israelites could have gone to Moses and said, Moses, how do we know God talking to you? And they did. Some did. You know what Moses would have done if he was finished with it? He would have handed the scroll of Leviticus and, say, and just look at him and say, you think I came up with that by myself? God told me what to write down. Look at all these gods. Well, I, I didn't just figure this stuff out. I grew up in Egypt. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, he wrote the Torah, but that's his proof here. Here's the first five scrolls of the Bible. Um... Well, at that time, it would have been the only five scrolls, and that's the talk. Well, I'm telling you the same thing. This is scripture. God told me to write it. I'm certainly not a person capable of. I'm a, I was a lawyer, but I wasn't, I wasn't an intellectual. I wasn't so, it, it was hard for me to get through all school. I had to study night and day. It's not, you know, I'm a smart guy, but I'm just not super intelligent. I can't figure out what no sages and rabbis could figure out before me. I mean, I become the smartest religious Jew of all time. It's not possible. That's the answer. And if it's not possible, people, what is it? It's a miracle. Who performs miracles? God and God alone. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoy it.